The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you. So we're going to look again today into the book of Romans, uh, chapter 9, 10, and 11, where we've been the last uh, a little while. And uh, we allow the Spirit of God to teach us some fantastically important information here and to banish the confusion that, that surrounds these chapters uh, in, in, in religion. It's amazing how much uh, religious confusion centers around these three great chapters in the book of Romans. These are, this is the dispensational section of the book of Romans. The first eight chapters have laid down the foundation of God's grace and how God has equipped the believer today as a member of the body of Christ to live in time on planet earth for God's glory. Every detail of your victory, the victory that God has made, given you in Christ Jesus and how that can be brought into the details of your life and how you can live successfully day by day in the details of your life for God's glory. Have it be Christ living in you and through you for His glory. God, Jesus Christ gave his life for you at Calvary so he could give his life to you when you trusted him so he could live his life through you day by day as you walk by faith and an intelligent understanding of his word to you. And that's what the first eight chapters of the book of Romans do. They lay that foundation for you. Then there's an immediate, abrupt, really tremendous shift of emphasis in chapter 9. And we, we, we looked at that last time. And I tried to show you that uh, what Paul is doing here is he's making the contrast now in chapter 9, 10, and 11. This is the third section of the book of Romans. This is the dispensational section. The first two sections were doctrinal, laying down the doctrinal foundation of grace. Now we're going to look at the fact that he's going to say, you are not Israel. You are the body of Christ. The nation Israel, if you're going to understand the Bible, you've got to understand the nation Israel. And that's why Paul starts out this way. I say the truth in Christ, lie and lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish my, that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. God has, has this chosen nation, this great uh, purpose and plan in the prophetic scripture for the nation Israel. And he's got this, this, this position that he's given to them. And uh, they're, they're a central part in the plan and purpose of God. They, they're a critical part in, in what God has been promising to do in the earth from the time he put Adam on the earth. And so Paul is, is describing that, their importance, and yet they've been set aside. They've been cut off. He said, I have a great continu I, I'm, I'm, I'm heavy hearted because Israel's been set aside. I'd be willing to be set aside for them, allow them to come and, and, and take the position of blessing. God has, has this, this wonderful nation, and yet He has set them aside in order to form a new agency, the church, the body of Christ. And what you're going to see in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is an explanation of why and how that's come about, and specifically the fact that what God's doing today is not, don't, He's not uh, cast away the nation Israel permanently. He's not forsaken Israel. He's not through with Israel. Therefore, you are not Israel. And you see the great uh, confusion, uh, fundamental confusion, that has stolen the key of understanding God's Word away from the church, the body of Christ, in large measure, is the failure to understand that the body of Christ is not Israel and Israel is not the body of Christ. To make that distinction between those two 
entities and those two agencies of God. To understand the Bible, you've got to understand the nation Israel. And that's why Paul starts out talking about how important they are. Verse number 6, he says, Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. He set them aside, but it's not like God's word didn't work, because his word did work. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they the children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When he chose Abraham and then he chose Isaac, he didn't choose Ishmael. Abraham had two boys. He didn't choose Ishmael. He didn't choose any of those sons that, that, that Abraham had after Sarah died with, with Kuchar. He chose Isaac. Then Isaac has Esau and Jacob, and he doesn't choose Esau. He chooses Jacob. So God's word did work. When it says Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's Abraham, Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. God's word does work. That is, verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the, the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children being not born, yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Verse 12, when it says, the elder shall serve the younger, that's a quote from Genesis 25, when the boys were born. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated, that's a quote from the book of Malachi, referring not to Jacob the individual, and Esau the individual, but the nation that came out of them. And what he's saying is, what God planned and what God purposed, you know what? That's exactly what's happened in the history of Israel. God planned, God purposed, God elected the nation Israel. And the Word did its job. And, and, and the Word formed the nation Israel. And it did its job by calling out Isaac and then calling out Jacob. And the purpose of God that God chose to accomplish, make them His chosen nation in the earth, I draw on the chalkboard for you all the time. In time past, God divided humanity between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. And that circumcision, that nation Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the nation that comes from the 12 tribes of Jacob, the nation Israel, that, the word of God, God's word, God's purpose accomplished all that. So the word did work. What should we say then, verse 14? In other words, What's the problem? If the Word worked, what do we say about why God has set them aside? Is there unrighteousness with, unrighteousness with God? And what Paul's going to point out here is that the Word worked, and he formed the nation Israel, but he did it on his own terms. For he said unto Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, or him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. You see, God, with the purpose of God according to election, that's God's purpose. <laughs> and God does His thing. He formed His nation according to His own plan and His own purpose, not somebody else's. Verse 19, Paul anticipates another objection. Wilt thou say then unto me, in other words, if there's not unrighteousness with God, God's dealing righteously and justly, executing his own purpose and plan. Well, is if that's not the problem, wilt thou, why dost thou yet find fault? Who hath resisted his will? Somebody says, well, he's unfair. It's just not fair what he's doing. Isn't it interesting how we always want fairness? Usually you need, you, know, you, don't, you don't really need justice, you need mercy. <laughs> uh, but uh, people won't think, well, that's not fair. Because I'm not for, and God says, hey, wait a minute. O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing form? Say to him that formed it, 
Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and the other under, another unto dishonor? What if God willingly show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, that he might and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory, even us? You say, what's he talking about? He said, Hey, you know what? God's God's not unfair. If he takes, you go to the potter's house, Jeremiah 18, and the potter is making the clay into a vessel. He's got it on the wheel, and he's turning the wheel, and he's making the vessel. You remember the story in Jer Jeremiah 18? You, you look it up. Jer God told Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house and look at what happens. And he makes that vessel, and while he's making it, it was marred in his hands. There was an imperfection in it. And so what did he do? He pushed it all back down into the lump again, and then he remade it, reshaped it. And what Jeremiah says to, Israel, to Jerry back there, what, what God says to Jeremiah back there and to Israel through Jeremiah is, that's what I'm doing with Israel. I'm the potter. I'm the one who had the purpose. I'm the one that decided what kind of vessel I was going to make. And then if the vessel's messed up, if I then squish it back down and remake it, reshape it. That's my business. The clay didn't decide it was going to be a teacup or a soup bowl. That's what the potter does. And it says, look, if Israel, if I take Israel and reshape it, and through the fall of Israel, send salvation to the Gentiles, that's not being unfair. That's my prerogative. That's my choice, because I'm the one who sets it up. And then in verse 30, he says, what should we say then? I mean, what would motivate God to do that if God's working on his own time schedule, working on his own plans? What should we say then? What's the conclusion based on the reshaping of Israel? And that's what God did. He literally reshaped the nation Israel. They were his chosen nation. They were circumcision, uncircumcision through the fall of Israel. He concluded them all in unbelief. He took Israel out of that position of privilege and reshaped her into position, put her into the position of a Gentile. He reshaped her status before him. What, 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 what's that? Verse 30, he says, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed not after the law of righteousness, hath not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith. You see, that's the problem. You needed, Israel needed faith in God's word for God's word to bear fruit. You see, it's always the Word of God that works effectually in you that believe. And so Israel says, well, wait a minute. If I had to believe God's Word, did I have it? Oh, yeah, sure you had it. Chapter number 10, he says that I bear them record that they had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And he goes on to describe how that what Israel did is they had God's word, but they didn't learn the lesson that God's word teaches. What does the law tell them? They need a savior. Had they been believing God's word all the time that they had it, it would have been preparing them, been a schoolmaster, so that when Christ the Savior, the Messiah, showed up, they'd have believed him. Jesus told them that in John 5. He says, you've got Moses and the prophets. They testify of me. If you believe them, you'd believe me. If they had been in the habit of believing God's word, when the word became flesh and showed up among them, you know what they'd have done? They would have believed him. Why? Because they were in the habit of believing God's word. But they weren't. They were gripped by unbelief. They were gripped by religious deception. Jesus, when he talks to the Pharisees in John 8, they say, we have Abraham as our father. He says what Paul says in Romans 9 there. He says, they all they that are of Abraham are not Abraham. Being a physical descendant of Abraham is not enough. You also had to be blessed with faithful Abraham. You had to believe like Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Romans 4, he's all.
For he told them, Abraham's the father of all them that believe. And that's why Jesus told them, you might have Abraham as your physical father, but your father is the devil. Spiritually, you see, they were filled with unbelief. They didn't believe God's word. They believed all kind of religion. They believed all kind of things that told them that they were good enough and that they could work enough and that they could make God accept them on their own. But they weren't willing to believe that they needed a Savior. So when he showed up, what did they do? Well, verse, chapter 11, verse 11 says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. You say, well, when did that happen? When did they stumble and not fall? Chapter 9, verse 33, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoso believeth on him is not, shall not be ashamed. It's only one time in history God ever laid in Zion a, a, rock of, a rock of offense and a stone upon which they were going to stumble. That's the Messiah. That's Jesus Christ. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Christ comes to them, presents himself to them. And they stumble. They say, we'll not have this man reign over us. We'll have no king but Caesar. And they don't just allow him to be killed like they did John the Baptist. They demand that Rome execute him. They reject him. He says how they stumble. They stumble at that stumbling stone, but they didn't fall. Then Romans 11, 11 says, but... Rather, through their fall. Then they did fall subsequent to that. They didn't fall at the cross, but later on when God gave them a renewed opportunity for repentance, the Holy Spirit comes from heaven and fills, it, fills the little flock, and they go out in that Pentecostal era of signs and wonders and miraculous demonstrations to confirm the word to them. Jesus had warned them. He said, you speak a word against the Son of Man. It'll be forgiven you. They did, and it was. He on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But he said, you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. It won't be forgiven you. This world of the world to come. They did blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Stephen in Acts 7 stands there and says to the, religious, the leaders of Israel, the Senate and Council of the Nation, says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. They'd have no part of what God, the Holy Spirit, was ministering to them through the little flock. And through the fall of Israel, salvation went to the Gentiles. So how'd that happen? Well, it didn't happen according to prophecy. In Acts 7, when Stephen sees, says that, and they, begin to, they, they go out and get a stone and committed together and start to kill him, he looks up into heaven and steadfast into heaven, and he sees the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. Now, the posture is important. Because in Acts 2, Stephen says that Psalm 110 verse 1 was fulfilled when the Father said to the Son, Come and sit thou at my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. Well, if he went up and sat down in Acts 2, and he's going to sit there at the Father's right hand until his foes are to be made his footstool, and then in Acts 7, Stephen sees him not sitting at the Father's right hand, but standing, then what does Psalm 110 verse 1 tell you? He's doing standing up. The time had come, he was ready to make his foes his footstool. He was ready to come, and he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. He shall speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. He was ready to inaugurate the day of his wrath. He said, but well, it didn't come. I know it didn't. Isn't that marvelous? Rather, when he, he comes back, but rather than destroying his enemies, he saved the chief opponent, the Apostle Paul. Paul was going out, breathing out threatenings. He literally had letters from the government of Israel to go and take people that named the name of Christ and compel them to recant, to torture them, to waterboard them, even to execute them, to make them recant. Leading with the official documents of his nation, their rebellion against the Messiah. Christ comes back and instead of destroying the leader of the world's rebellion, he saved him. <laughs> you say, where is that in Scripture? It wasn't before Paul. 
Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, I before was a blasphemer. Jesus said you blaspheme and you, don't get, you can't be saved in this world, the world to come. Literally, God had to stick a new world in there, a new dispensation. Because there was no forgiveness for Paul in that Pentecostal dispensation. And there wouldn't be any forgiveness for Paul in the kingdom when it comes. So God interrupts the prophetic program and introduces a new program. That's what Romans 11, 11 is talking about. Through the fall of Israel, not the rise of Israel in, in her glory, but through the fall of Israel, salvation goes to the Gentiles. That's why Paul says in verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Israel had 12 apostles to sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. When God set the nation of Israel aside, their job went away. He replaced them with Paul, one apostle, for the one body of Christ. By the way, what a great example. Paul was a, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin. He bragged about it in Ephesians, Philippians 3. But he also was a Roman citizen. He bragged about that in the book of Acts. He was a Jew and a Gentile in one person. That's exactly what the body of Christ is. He takes Jew and Gentile, puts us together in one spiritual body of believers called the church, the body of Christ, and our former status isn't an issue anymore. Now, the question arises, if that's where we are in Paul's ministry, what about Israel? What about all those promises God made to Israel? Where'd they go? He hadn't fulfilled them. We aren't Israel. They're not being accomplished today. Is God just through with them? Well, that's why he says in verse 25, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits. I want you to understand this secret program that's been revealed through me, Paul says, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now it's made manifest. I want you to understand that because what it tells you is that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. Now, if what God's doing today was not written, was a secret, but what God wrote in time past was written in prophecy, and after the dispensation of grace, after the body of Christ is filled up, the fullness of the Gentiles come in, what God's doing today is completed. What's going to happen? He's going to go back and finish the prophetic program. Israel will be saved as it is written. They shall come out of Zion of the Deliverer, shall turn away in godliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them, when I shall take away their sins." God is going to fulfill. You see, he's only temporarily interrupted the prophetic program. He hasn't replaced Israel with the body of Christ. It's called replacement theology. It's a lie pitched. It's a lie taught in the name of Scripture and Christianity because people fail to recognize the distinctive ministry that God committed to the Apostle Paul and that message given through Paul for us today. And that rather than doing away with Israel or making us Israel, he simply interrupted the program for Israel and put in an unprophesied, unexpected program. And when our program today is over with, when the body of Christ is completed and we're taken out of, of, of the sentence, then he'll go back and finish his plan and purpose with the nation Israel. Listen to how he says it. Verse 28. As concerning the gospel, what God's doing today, they're enemies for our sake. Through the fall of Israel, salvation is going to the Gentiles. But as touching the election, remember what the election was, chapter 9? That he's going to form a nation to serve him. They're beloved for the Father's sake. You see, God's plan and purpose for the nation Israel has not been canceled. It's just been postponed for a while. For the gifts and calling of God without repentance, God gave His word. He won't go back on it. For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their, their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they might, uh, might obtain mercy. For God that concluded them all in unbelief, that He might have mercy upon all. 
The whole scope of the dispensation of grace is laid out in Romans 9, 10, and 11, especially as it relates to the nation Israel, so that you don't think that God has replaced Israel with us, rather that you would understand that God has set aside the nation Israel temporarily, interrupted their program in order to form the body of Christ, and then one day he isn't through with Israel, he'll go back and finish his program with Israel. Well, if he isn't through with Israel, then you aren't Israel. I'm not Israel. And trying to be Israel is a futile process. Rather, we need to rejoice in an understanding of who we really are in Christ and not allow our identity to be confused. That's why those first eight chapters of Romans lays, out, lays that foundation so thoroughly for you. And then he comes along and he says, now understand how it relates to all the rest of the Bible. God has changed the program. Today's form of the church, the body of Christ. But he's not through with this plan with the purpose with Israel. He'll accomplish that too. God has one great plan and purpose in his universe. That's to make his son the head of all things. He'll make him the head of all things in the heavens through the body of Christ. All things in the earth through the nation Israel. So that Jesus Christ will be exalted as the head of all things. And that's the reason he finishes this chapter with this great enunciation of, of the wisdom. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his ways, his judgments, and his ways past finding out. You see the wisdom of God in the way he's doing his thing. Well, we have to go. See you next time. Till then, Maranatha.